I have been fired, managed out, underpaid and often felt undervalued, bored, burnt out, all of these things. And I've had plenty of hard days at work. Now, uh, 10 years later, I have my own career coaching business. I've done over 4,124 hours of coaching sessions and I'm very satisfied with where my career is. Hi, my name is Ronan Kennedy and I'm a career coach and podcast host. I'm interviewing people from various different careers, industries and backgrounds to find out what they do, how they got into it and what they like or dislike about their roles. So whether you're a seasoned professional looking for some inspiration or whether you're a new grad looking for some ideas and options, this podcast has something for you. So join us every week as we delve into the world of work, share personal professional development tips and uncover the secrets to a fulfilling career. Over the weeks, I'm doing podcasts with people from different professions to understand their journey, where they've come from, what they're doing now. And in this podcast, I'd like to tell you a little bit about my journey. OK, so here we go. Um, so I suppose my, my first job was during college when I worked in a hotel picking up glasses. Um, really, I had, I had no idea what I was, I was doing. I couldn't change kegs or anything like that. Um, but one of the first things they got me to do was to uh, deliver glasses to tables. And I remember it was kind of a, a terrifying experience because I assumed for, I don't know what reason, but I just assumed that if you want to carry glasses well, you have to spread them out on a tray. So I had them spread spread out all across a tray, champagne glasses, pints of Guinness, all this sort of stuff. And as I walked towards the table, the, the, uh, one, of the one or two of the glasses started to shake, they fell. And then I tried to rebalance it as I was going. And the whole tray fell on the floor. Now, you might think that's bad. That's a bad first day at work ever. And that's a bad first day in a new job. But that happened two more times on the same night where uh, I tried to balance the glasses all across the tray and they fell down right on the carpet, right in front of customers. So let's just say it was a pretty shaky start to begin my my job, my new job in the, in the hotel and my career. So uh, after that job and after finishing college, I was working during the summer or tr- tr- throughout the summers, I was working in the local golf club where a lot of people would caddy, they would carry bags for tourists and give them tips about their uh, their game. I suppose that was my, my first my first attempt at giving people advice, giving people tips and um, guiding them through through a course or guiding them through a journey was on the on the golf course. Um, uh, and then after that, I guess I was doing some gardening. I was work with individuals. And figuring out like what they wanted uh, in their garden because that was just the job that was offered to me. I I had no idea what I was going to do. I knew I wanted to do something that I was really passionate about and very excited about. Um, so then after a while, um, you know, one of my friends said, "Look, let's go to Australia." And I thought, I this is a great opportunity to uh, expand my horizons, try something new. And let's face it, my career wasn't going anywhere. I didn't feel I was going anywhere, so I jumped at this opportunity to go to Australia. Went to Australia with eight friends. We had an absolutely fantastic time. My social life was amazing, but the problem I had was I was uh, not doing anything for a job. I I tried to get uh, a nice office job, but that didn't really really work out for me. Uh, I didn't know what to apply for. I didn't know what my skills were. I had no kind of office experience, so to speak. So that was really tough trying to figure out uh, what to do. So, of course, we ran into money problems. I ran into money problems, and what I had to do then was go and get a job in uh, a coffee shop. I thought this would be nicer than the bar because the timetable would suit me better. So I got a job in uh, a coffee shop. But after a few weeks, I got less and less shifts. And then eventually one week I had no shifts. I went to my manager and I said, "Uh, hey, I've got no shifts next week. Um, What's the deal? And the manager just said, yeah, you've no shifts. And uh, it took me a moment or two to realize that uh, I was now officially fired from that job. I wasn't a very good barista um, and uh, I didn't understand the way the coffee shop worked. And to be fair, all through college, I'd been learning how to, um, you know, how to work in a business, how to uh, do strategies, how to do marketing plans. And now I was in a hospitality sector. It's a totally different business. It's a totally different industry. And I had no idea what I was doing. Um, so that didn't last too long. I think it was only about five weeks in the end. Um, while I was doing that, I was also pursuing the idea of playing classical guitar or Spanish guitar. So I was walking around Melbourne looking for jobs in, in cafes and restaurants and hotels. So I literally went in with business cards, 
and a CD of uh, some of my recordings and gave people the, the recordings and gave them the business cards and say, hey, you can listen here and I'll come in and I'll do, uh, I'll do a free session for you if you like. And so walking all around Melbourne, I think I found four, maybe five gigs in total. And none of them lasted very long because uh, I, I only had a set of about 30 or 40 minutes. And really to do that sort of performance, you need really probably three, four, maybe even five hours that you can rotate on an ongoing basis. But nevertheless, it did teach me that if you do go out and hunt for opportunities and if you knock on doors and kind of do cold calling in, in a way, that people will entertain you that you know some people will listen to you um so that was the guitar then someone offered me uh, a job at a bookshop so i jumped at that and it was bookshop assistant for six weeks but that was only ever a six-week job so that didn't go anywhere and then i got a job in a bar and working in the bar was uh was nice it was a nice bar and uh and restaurant and i really enjoyed working with my colleagues but the thing about that is again um, I found it hard to get into that lifestyle. I found it difficult to uh, understand the wines, understand the beers, be able to you know, make the different cocktails. And I still had to figure out how to make coffees for um, for the customers. So uh, this was still a little bit more technical than uh, than I was able to uh, to work at at the time. And I guess I, I, I could have probably done more training. I could have done more self-learning. I guess I just didn't have the maturity at that time, um, around 22, 23. I didn't have the maturity to say, okay, I need to go away and learn about all these wines or I need to go away and figure out how to make coffees or do a coffee training course. Um, So I never did it. I just struggled through the job day to day. Um, I did ask for training, additional training and help from my manager and from the owner, but they were very busy trying to run the restaurant and keep it profitable and keep customers in. So I didn't get that training that I needed. There was a bit of tension then between the the manager and me because, well, I wasn't able to perform. It's not that I didn't have the motivation. I did. I just wasn't uh, able to, uh, you know, prepare the the drinks and prepare the the the, the orders in, in the way that they were uh, satisfied with. So a natural thing that a manager does in that case is they can't really fire you a lot of the time. Uh, for legal reasons, or if the owner really wants you to be there. So they just have to slowly make your life difficult and manage you out. And that's what was happening to me. So although I actually got on really well with this manager, uh, he started to manage me out over a couple of weeks, make my life difficult, um, be a little bit unpleasant to me. And then eventually one day, you know, because I needed the job so much, uh, I had to kind of confront him on this and say, look, I re- I'm trying hard. I really need this job. And I would like if you gave me a chance. So if you give me a chance and I work with you and you work with me, we can make this a more pleasant environment for both of us. Otherwise, it's just going to be difficult and I'm going to stay here because let's be honest, I need the money. (laughs) Uh, And he just immediately turned around and said, yeah, okay, fine. And then our uh, working relationship immediately got better. And I think that was just thanks to confronting the issue and being like radically honest about it. So um, once I overcame that, I, I kind of felt maybe I, I scratched that itch, like I dealt with that problem. I hadn't just run away from it. Then I went back to Ireland to have another go at finding a job in my, my field. At the time, or sorry, from college, I had studied international business in Japanese. So I really thought pursuing Japanese uh, was a good idea because that was my unique selling point. I you know, was applying for jobs that required Japanese. I was looking at jobs in in Dublin and in Japan, but it never really came to fruition. I remember get, getting offered or, or getting a potential interview for a job in Lithuania in a call center, but that didn't seem like a good idea. The salary wasn't very good. I didn't like the idea of relocating to uh, Lithuania, and it seemed sounded like a bit of a mad idea when I told my mum. So um, yeah, working in Ireland. Uh, got more bar work working for a relative. That was straightforward, but I really felt like I was in a dead end. I knew I wanted to do something more meaningful, but I still couldn't figure out what that was. And I thought, I really want to take time before fully committing. I think that's one of the things uh, I could have done better. One of my um, mistakes was hesitating too much, not not trying things in different industries and really waiting a long time before trying anything because 
I was trying so hard to make the perfect decision that I didn't make any decision. I just continued working in bars, which weren't for me. Whereas if I just worked in a couple of different office jobs and figured out what I enjoyed and what I didn't enjoy, I think I would have learned much quicker. Or if I read some books or if I spoke to more people, I guess I was just waiting to be struck with this idea of my my passion. So um, I was totally stagnating. And then I had this idea, okay, look, I'm going to go to Japan and you know get get a job there, whether it be teaching English or working in customer service or something. So I I mean, that felt great because I just totally committed to this new um, this new direction. I booked my flights. I booked a hostel. I went up to Japan. I spent the first month looking for any job I could. And then I got offered a job as a English teacher. So that was great. It gave me a salary, gave me some structure, gave me a way to meet new people, make new friends. Um, I did that for eight or nine months. I had a blast. And then eventually I felt like, look, I'm stagnating again here. I don't want to be a Japanese, or I don't want to be an English teacher in Japan for the rest of my career. I don't feel growth. I don't feel progression. I don't feel super passionate about it. So I did feel like it was a good option, a good opportunity because I took action. I took massive action. I followed it through, but I wasn't really, yeah, I didn't see a future in it. Then one day my brother calls me and he says, look, why don't you come home? I'll give you a job. I've just set up a high performance coaching company and you can work for me. You can do operations and marketing and business development. So I said, okay, I don't know what those things are, but sure, let's do it. So I went home. I started working with my brother's company and we had a blast. We were, uh, it was very rough and ready. It was very much like a startup vibe. I didn't really know what I was doing. And he was trying to guide me as best he could while trying to run his business uh, on, you know, uh, full time on the other hand. Um, he was working with high performance athletes, uh, coaching them to be better, uh, helping them uh, with their, their strength, their mobility, their flexibility, their endurance, all these type of, of things. So that was tons of fun. And we went from, uh, I went from working uh, at home in my bedroom to working in a gym in the Aviva Stadium to eventually working in like a, I think it was a 5,000 square foot facility out in Blanchardstown. So we had a blast and we were learning all about developing apps and updating the website and doing social media and how to market and how to create pi- pricing and products and all these things I'd, I'd never learned before. So it really felt like a master's and um, really felt like a, an MBA, a master's degree in business. And we were trying to tap into uh, mentors and we were trying to make deals with other partners and we succeeded in a, in a lot of these things. Um, probably I should have delegated more responsibility or I should have got more people to help me um, because eventually I felt like totally, uh, I, I, you know, I was trying to manage the website, I was trying to uh, sell to clients and develop the business and do marketing. Uh, so eventually I felt totally burnt out and I wasn't able to see a future for myself uh, in the business, but it was very difficult because it's a family business. And when it's a family business, it's very personal and you want to give your best to it. Of course, I want to look after my brother and make sure he was going to be okay. So I felt huge responsibility towards him. But then eventually I, I just had to say, you know what, I, I think I want to uh, take a different step. Uh, uh, and, and I planned my exit. And, and how this came about was I was in the office one day and I was reading this book that my brother had on his shelf, a, a book uh, on emotional intelligence by a guy called Daniel Goldman. Now, Daniel Goldman um, is a, yeah, he's a writer, he's a psychologist, all that sort of stuff. And he'd written this book about how emotional intelligence is really one of the key things that allows people to progress in their career. And above all the lessons that I learned in it, I was just really struck by this idea that there's this whole other sphere of psychology and working with people and helping people get the best out of themselves and helping people understand what their needs are and what their values are and what's important to them. And I was kind of blown away by this. So I I do what we all do these days. I went on Google and YouTube and I started to research this more. And the more I came across this idea of psychology and psychotherapy and coaching and communication, all these types of soft skills, it just resonated with me so much. Um, I, I was talking to my sister then and she was like, well, I've got a friend, Elga, she does coaching, you should speak to her. I said, oh my God, amazing, let's talk to Elga. Um, and I went to speak to Elga and she was fantastic. So I went in, I did, I think it was about four or five hours with her over a couple of sessions, like two hour sessions, two and a half hour sessions. And she was like listening and taking notes and helping me clarify my thoughts. I thought, oh my God, this is amazing. Then I went on this other 
journey of like looking into Tony Robbins. Tony Robbins is one of the, the biggest coaches in the world, probably the biggest, you know, he does uh, career stuff, life, co- life coaching, relationship coaching, business coaching. He does the whole shoot and match. So I was on YouTube watching his videos. I was speaking to Elga and then eventually I was, I was bringing together this plan, this plan of um, basically going on an adventure uh, to Spain, which was part of my overall dream or life ambition or bucket list, whatever you want to say, of embarking on a new career journey into coaching and psychology and, and personal development, all that sort of stuff. Um, and then starting my own business. So all of this was heading in the right direction. I was super excited about it. I wasn't really sure what the end point was going to be, but I knew the next steps felt super right. So with the help of Elga, I plotted my next steps. And uh, I told my brother I was going to uh, go to Spain. And when I was in Spain, that was going to allow me, firstly, to live one of my dreams of living in Spain. Secondly, to have the, the mental space and a break to study coaching and to set up my own business um, and to, yeah, to, to really just make the next steps. Um, and then I was just going to survive um, by teaching English to, you know, get enough money to, to live on. So that's what I did. I went to Spain. Uh, I started teaching English. I found some clients there. And I didn't know, know it at the time, but that was actually a great step because that allowed me to um, learn how to get clients, right? Because when you learn how to get students for teaching English, you also kind of learn how to get clients um, for a coaching business or any sort of self-employment uh, consultancy. Um, so over a year and a half, I was living and working in Spain, having a great time. But again, I knew it wasn't going to be forever. And I also knew probably I wasn't going to set up my business in Spain. I wanted to set it up at home. I wanted to set it up at Ireland, in Ireland. And I wanted to um, be able to do workshops and be be there in person. So so that's what I did. I went back to Ireland. And when I was there, um, I started to uh, map out my services and I started to uh, meet with friends and meet with family and try to do some coaching sessions with them. Now, one of the problems I ran into was I was just offering coaching, right? Because that's what my courses were. I did two courses with Tony Robbins. I read read all of his books. There was another therapist on the course, a lady named Chloe Madness. I read her seven books. I did coaching calls with her one-to-one. That was all fantastic. Thoroughly enjoyed the, the two courses that I did. And I read read tons of books in the area, all the books, they, all the recommended reading. I read everything I could get my hands on. Um, but then when I was uh, uh, kicking off, I, w- I was kind of offering coaching. This is one of the mistakes I made or one of the problems I had. And I didn't really have a super clear focus on what I was helping people with. Um, I was trying to help them achieve their goals. And that's kind of all I had. Um, but coming from a business background in college and a business background in work as well, um, I found over the days and weeks and months that more and more people were really struggling. One of the biggest problems they were really struggling with work was career issues. They found it hard to change jobs. They found it hard to update their CV, to understand what their direction was. And they wanted coaching around this. So really, I got into the idea of career coaching through listening to what clients were really struggling with and dealing straight on with those challenges. So... I didn't decide to be a career coach from the very start. I was a coach and I was helping people with their development. Um, but only when I became a career coach, that's when I really felt the interest from clients. So that was very exciting. But, you know, one of the issues I had was financial stability. I decided that I was just going to go full steam ahead, launch my coaching business. And fingers crossed that everything was going to work out well and I was going to have enough clients to sustain myself. Alas, I did not. Um, if I was to go back and do it again, I would, uh, I, w- I would do it sequentially. I would have a full-time job or at least a part-time job and I would set up my coaching business on the side. The benefit of doing it whole hog, like 100% of the time, was I was able to learn really quickly, figure out all the mistakes as, as quick as possible and make progress. The downside was I put myself under financial pressure, which wasn't good. Um, But I, you know, I was able to, I was able to get through it. Then, um, so in order to get over that financial pressure issue, so what I did is I got like uh, consultancy work or part time work as a a trainer, right? So kind of a coach and a trainer um, for another organization, 
That was the uh, the Entrepreneurs Academy in Dublin. They were working in Smithfield at the time. So the benefit of that was I could I could work as a I could do some coaching and I could do some training, um, so use very similar skills as part of their brand, and I could do it on a part time basis and I could earn good fees and that would give me time and space to work with my individual clients and some uh, financial stability in the short to medium term. So that was a really great help. It also allowed me to expand my my client list. Um, eventually, when I built up uh, enough clients, I was able to step away from the training for other companies and just go 100% with my own clients. But how I did that was a bit of a, a surprise to myself. So I was doing online workshops. I was trying to do uh, Facebook posts. I was trying to do um, you know, ads on social media platforms. I was trying to uh, talk to friends and family and stuff like that. None of those were really working. And uh, I was struggling with this. And one day I said to my mom, I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I feel like I've got so much off to offer. This is all this sort of coaching and psychology stuff has made a huge difference in my life, but I don't know how to share that with other people and I don't know how to uh, to get clients. I know if I'm interested in it for sure other people are going to find it useful as well. And she just said, you know, look, it's sometimes it's darkest before the dawn. Um and then I remember the next day I think or you know a couple of days later uh, I went onto Google Ads and I put an advertisement in there uh, and, you know, people started to give me phone calls and send me messages. And it, it finally struck me that in order to get clients for anything, you have to figure out where people are looking for you. And if you figure out where people are looking for you, you can reach them right there. So often we're just presenting advertisements and we're presenting our services or our products where we want people to to be but really the question is like they're cold they're, they're cold leads or cold you know clients but warm clients are people who are looking for you so really the best thing to do is figure out where they're looking for you and then approach them there or have them approach you and then by the time they get in touch it's like a warm lead it's a warm client so that's what I eventually did uh, I reached out to people or people reached out to me from clicking on Google Ads uh, getting on the phone and chatting through their issues. And when I was on those phone calls, I was really trying to solve people's problems as much as possible. And then through that, eventually people started to book sessions. I built up my client list. I was able to deliver more and more value to them. Uh, and off we go. We were up and running. So that was all really, really exciting. Um, I was meeting clients in hotels um, in the lobby and that was fine, but it wasn't ideal. So eventually I booked um, a room, you know, uh, on an hourly basis with a therapist, but only when I booked my own office and that felt like a big commitment at the time. I booked my office beside a yoga studio and worked with, I uh, worked alongside some uh, lovely yoga teachers there. But that was really where I was able to uh, have kind of control of my own environment, meet as many clients as I wanted, have my own space, put stuff on the wall, and have some sort of you know uh, agency and authority over my own space. So that was really fantastic. Then I grew my business from there. I started to do more blogs, started posting uh, videos on YouTube. Um, and I think I ramped up my business so much over the years that eventually, you know, you can do too many sessions in one day or too many sessions in one week. And not that I got burnt out with energy, but I figured that you can get emotionally burnt out. And I think I got emotionally burnt out then uh, at some at some stage along that journey. That's where you really just can't listen as well as you should. You're not 100% in the zone. And I had to learn that the hard way where I spent, I think, a weekend just you know walking in nature and chilling out and taking a break from it all. And I had to come back and say, okay, I need to limit the amount of hours I do each day and each week. Otherwise, I can't give myself 100% to clients. And that was a kind of hard thing for me to realize because I always remember that I wanted to work as hard as possible, give as much value to people as possible um, and progress as much as possible, as quickly as possible. And then I had to come to that re realization that no, you have to take a step back and you have to, yeah, um, yeah, just reprioritize a little bit. Then COVID. Uh, COVID was, yeah, COVID was tough, right? Because we had to, move everything online. And I was nervous about that because I thought maybe clients won't come to me anymore. 
maybe really the energy we get in person is is what everybody wants overall um but then you know it worked people were happy to go online once they felt their needs were being met and that we were making progress and that they were getting value from the sessions so that was fantastic go, going online and being able to then think about ways to uh, do more content on YouTube, write more blogs, uh, create more resources. So I used COVID as an opportunity. It, it was COVID was definitely quieter in terms of clients. I still had, I still had enough clients, probably more clients than I needed. But it was also it, it was definitely quieter. So it was an opportunity to rethink about the business and how I was going to grow it over the next 10, 15, 20 years. So I used that as an opportunity to write uh, seven ebooks, um, documenting basically the whole process that I that I use with clients, everything I've learned over the uh, the eight years at that stage, nine years now, or sorry, seven years at that stage, nine years now, uh, to document the whole process and and then use that as something uh, as a product I could sell and I could scale going forward because that's one of the other uh, I suppose mistakes I would have made is. Not thinking with the end in mind. I, uh, you know, I I started at the same time as a friend of mine, Sam, and he always thought he always started with the idea of scaling his business, whereas I thought I started with the idea of becoming self-employed and filling my hours. And I he he achieved scale, and I achieved filling my hours. So it really taught me that. Well, you have to be super careful about the way you set goals because if you achieve the goal you have to make sure that it's going to be the right goal for you to achieve so anyway I use COVID as an opportunity to uh, to reset the goal and think how am I going to grow my business how am I going to scale it and in many ways I don't know if you've ever heard this phrase before but if you if you're climbing a mountain um, and you get to the top of that mountain sometimes in order to get to a higher mountain you have to go down that mountain and go back up the higher mountain so that was the journey that I was on from there is going down one mountain to go back up uh, a higher mountain. So that was all about um, scaling the business. Uh, it was an audacious challenge, but it meant I had to rethink what I did, uh, package things in a totally different way uh, while still you know, working with clients and delivering value there. Um, I suppose when I think about you know, what has really made the difference for me in terms of working with clients it has been allowing them to see themselves not just the way they currently see themselves but really you know factually just see all the value that they inherently have because sometimes we forget it sometimes we focus on on negative things or hard times but one of the skills I developed was really being able to allow people to flourish, to open themselves up, to allow them to see all the value, all the skills, all the abilities, all the personal attributes they have, all the different ways they can be of benefit to an organization. Uh, and one of the keys was being able to to write well, being able to uh, help them articulate what they wanted to say, frame their abilities and their skills and their their profile or their personal brand in a way they felt comfortable with. So once I was able to do those things, people got a huge amount of clarity. It allowed them to build confidence because they could see it all written out in a way they felt comfortable. Uh, And that allowed me to really build my client list and continue to add value to people's lives. But one of, uh, and they got a lot of confidence through that as well. But one of the things I always found people would struggle with was even if we did this fantastic confidence building exercise in the middle of the, the session and they felt fantastic after it, if they spent the next 24 hours or the next seven days or the next 30 days uh, with negative self-talk about how they you know, weren't doing good work or they had done a bad job in the past or whatever it was, then it would really eat into all the good work that we had done. So one of the things that really struck me about build, building confidence in something is, hel- is helping them reframe and kind of you know re- rewire their brain to have positive uh, self-talk and a positive image of themselves so that they could, you know, uh, give themselves positive affirmations on an ongoing basis. And I'm, I'm not saying that we would get them to say something that they didn't really believe or that wasn't true, but just to be kinder to themselves, just to be nice to themselves, 
And so that was a, a super important learning for me. Um, of course, the the other important thing is, you know, that I found was when people would write more, like they would write out an experience, they would write out an example of when they'd done something well, or they would write a gratitude journal, or they would write victories down. When they wrote out those things for themselves, that's where I really felt that they could, could build confidence in, a, in an ongoing and sustainable way. I guess I worry that people don't think that's really going to be effective. They think confidence comes externally. But what I learned is that confidence, any confidence that comes externally can be taken away externally. Whereas when you build the confidence intrinsically, you build it from inside where you really believe it, where you really see the value, where you tell yourself that you've done well uh, in an honest way, not, not overly selling yourself or underselling yourself. That's the strongest confidence. And, and one of the things I noticed was when people had or have habitual questions that place loads of seeds of doubt in their mind, being able to counteract those questions with responses. So if the questions are always, why did I do that? Or why do I never get good opportunities? Or why do people talk to me like that? Or, you know, why do I keep messing up jobs? When we responded to those questions like, well, why don't you get good opportunities? Well, maybe if you were kinder to yourself and you applied for those opportunities and you updated your application, then maybe you'd allow yourself to, you know, get better applications. Or why do, um, you know, why do people speak to me a certain way that if we would just get to the core of it, get to the truth of it, then we'd be able to figure it out and uh, come to better conclusions around those. So, you know, I think the one other thing that I've really learned over the years is about um, is about finding uh, the beauty in the work that we do and finding what we are um, really passionate about. And I think the, the, the thing people mistake when they think about passion is they think passion is a subject. They think it's a, a piece of content. And I think in one respect it is, right? Um, you can be passionate about football or music or fashion or food or any of these things. But it's also about the way you do it. And I think it's much more about the way you do it. That's really a huge thing that I've learned over the last nine years. The, the way you do something, how you do your work, what your daily work lifestyle is like, is so important to you being satisfied at work, at you being confident at work. If you're working with good people, if, you're, if you have a nice work-life balance, if you have the opportunity to learn and grow, if you have the opportunity to have variety, if you have the opportunity to uh, take on new projects, if you have support, all of those things are not what, but they are how. And I think when you can be passionate about how you do things, like how you help people, how you create content, how you do a marketing plan, um, how you solve other people's problems, how you add value to customers, how you analyze data, right? How you uh, make money for people, whatever it is, when you can be passionate about those things and realize that that's where a lot of the passion lies, I think you get this clarity and confidence on a whole other level. So that is something that I really think is is a good takeaway. So um, thanks for watching this. I hope it's been helpful for you. Uh, these are some of my, my learnings over the last nine years. It's been a wonderful journey and I look forward to uh, hearing your thoughts and engaging with you later on. Thanks so much. Hi folks, thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed this interview, please click the like button. And if you'd like to see more of these soon, Please subscribe and support the channel.